the making. All that I give. Man, God is good. Anybody have that same, that same sentiment? When Danica started to tell, talk about her story, her testimony of being 19 and, and being pregnant, and now she's two sons and walking into a brand new house, bigger than my house, and it's, it's, that's a blessing. That's only a thing that God can do. And I'm thankful because it shows that even what happens right now is not the end of the story. How many of you know that there are chapters to your life? There are chapters, there are chapters, there are chapters. Tell that to the legacy that's next to you, to the children. Tell them it's chapters. Even if you don't think that they understand it, tell them there's chapters to your life. And in there being chapters to your life, we have to make sure that we don't give up on the chapter before they can complete the book. Amen? We can't stop on the chapter. We've got to complete the book. Chapter 23 may be bad, but chapter 24 is coming. And if we can make it through this season, I know that God is going to do something in due season. It says, if we don't give up, we shall reap a harvest. Your legacy is harvest. Tell the person that next to you, say, your legacy is harvest. And I know many times we get excited about harvest because we think about money, but no, harvest is all of the good things that God has for you. All of the, the plans that he has for your life, this is a part of your legacy. Every good thing that you do, it's a part of your legacy. Every mentorship program you take on, it's a part of your legacy. Every graphic that you design, it's a part of your legacy. Every word that's spoken, every message that's preached, every song that's sung, every journal that's written, every building that's constructed, every seed that's planted, everything we do has legacy tied to it. And if you want to be remembered, then don't do a lazy job. Don't do a half-decent job. Don't do a just good enough job. Make sure that when you live for Christ, that you put his step on it. So that when people see your work, they say, that's the work of the kingdom of God. Anybody ever heard of this gentleman? His name is Alfred Noble. Anybody ever heard of a guy named Alfred Noble? He doesn't live around these parts. He's not from Texas. Many of us probably have never uh, encountered Alfred Noble, but Alfred Noble uh, was a chemist, and he was the chemist that was able to invent dynamite. Anybody ever heard of dynamite? Dynamite. He, he created dynamite. Well, Alfred Noble, this guy that you've never met who created dynamite, had a brother named Ludwig, and Ludwig had passed away. And when it got to the reporters and it got to the papers, when it got to the news outlets, they didn't say that Ludwig died. They said that Alfred Doble died. And so in the paper, they began to write articles about the life and the legacy of Alfred Noble. And so one morning, Alfred got up and saw that they had put out this information that was wrong about his life. And since he had created dynamite, they said that he had left a legacy and being known for the merchant of death. They said that this guy had killed and murdered over millions of people that he never knew because he created dynamite. The merchant of death. Can you imagine waking up on a Saturday morning and they say, Jordan Jones is the merchant of death. That's your legacy. That's the thing that people will remember about you. The merchant of death. He's known for death. Not life, but, but death. And so Alfred Noble said that that day he made a quote that lives on. He says, everybody should be able to rewrite their obituary. Everybody should be able to rewrite their obituary. Everybody should be able to look at what I've done, and if it's not what I want to do, if it's not what I want to be remembered for, then it's my turn today to start to rewrite my obituary. Now, many of you never heard of Alfred Noble, but that day Alfred Noble said, I'll never be known for death again. And so what he did was all of the money that he had earned from being the merchant of death, he started to give it away. And he started to give away awards. And he started to give out, out things to people and notoriety and, and contributions. And he started to esteem people. And he came up with the Nobel Peace Prize. Alfred Noble, you don't know him as a person that kills people. You know him as something that's awarded to people that do something very great because he rewrote his obituary. 
And what I'm saying today before I even get into the message, today is the day that we can rewrite our story. If we don't like the way it's been going for the last 33, we can change it on 34 because 33 is only a chapter. 34 is greater. He says that we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. We can do it. So you've heard of Alfred Noble's story because we know many people that have received the Nobel Peace Prize. And one of the people that we celebrate in this month, one that's known to us and famous to us is Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. received the Nobel Peace Prize. Who would have thought that the man that was known for death would now be known for life? So when it goes down in history, what he did on the front end of his life will be very, very small. But the legacy that he lives will outlive he and his children's generation. Somebody give glory to God that you can rewrite your story. That everything can change with one word. One of the exercises that I want you guys to do when you, when you go home, I want you to write your own obituary. Because when we realize what we've done, and if it doesn't look like what we want to be doing, guess who's in control of that? Not God. You're in control of that. And so in this last message of pop, Pursuit of Purpose, I want you to really take this in that our decisions are our choice. That whatever mark we want to make on this world, it's up to us. Because God has already given us all of the intangibles. He's, he's deposited. He's invested in us. He's already told you that you're my future. He's already said that I've already given you my grace. I've already given you my peace. I've already hardwired you with forgiveness. That even if you mess up, you're already hardwired to be able to overcome that. I've already given you the intangibles that you need. I've deposited into you things that allow you to overcome the next obstacle in your life. But I need you to tap into it and just do it. And so if your life is not what you think it should be, then change it. And it doesn't amount to money. It doesn't mean that you have to switch. I'm not talking about a career. I'm talking about why you were put on this earth. Because when you do that, then you can sing the song, I want to live for you. And so it leads us into Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. And we're looking at verses 14 through 26. Somebody say Jeremiah 33, 14 through 26. This is how it starts off. It says the days are coming. Somebody say that the days are coming. Declares the Lord when I will fulfill the good promise. Somebody say good promise to the people of Israel and Judah. The days are coming. The days are coming when the promises, the good promises of God are coming to Israel and Judah. It says, and in those days... And at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. For this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. Nor will the Levitical priest ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to present sacrifices. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant, hmm, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer come at their appointed time, then my covenant with, my, with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites who are priests ministering before you can be broken and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on his throne. I want you to, to think about that. He says that if I'm not going to break my covenant with the sun and the moon, with nighttime and daytime, then the covenant that I make with you can't be broken. That's powerful stuff right there. As sure as we know it, in 24 hours, we will experience night and day. He says, as sure as you can experience night and day, you will be able to experience the promise that I have coming for you. 
he says, I will make the descendants, descendants of David my servant and the Levites who minister before me as, a, as countless as the stars in the sky and as measureless as the sand on the seashore. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not noticed that these people are saying the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose? So they despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. This is what the Lord says. If I have not made my covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven and earth, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, for I will restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. Somebody say legacy. Say, I am God's legacy. See, your mistakes are not your legacy. I need you to, I need you to feel that. I need you to feel that. I need you to feel that. My mistakes are not my legacy. My mistakes are not my legacy. My failures are not my legacy. My sin is not my legacy. My legacy is the promise of God. You believe that? I believe it. I believe it. My legacy is the promises of God. You are a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. Jordan, you're a masterpiece. John, you're a masterpiece. Sam, you are a masterpiece. Masterpieces are not made overnight. Masterpieces come in sections and they come in forms. They, they come in seasons. They come as a continual work. The better, the longer the project, the greater the masterpiece. The longer the time spent on the masterpiece, the longer folks will remember the masterpiece. As a slingshot, they say the further you're stretched, the further the rock will be catapulted. And so no longer do I have to define myself as it took me a long time to get it right. I know that it was all a part of my masterpiece. But the great part about a masterpiece is it's never stuck. It's never positioned. It's never stuck on one part of the masterpiece. It has to be developed as a project. Some of us would never dare to, to, to accept the thought of being a project, but we're God's project. And when God is working on a project, he never sleeps, he never slumbers, he never stops masterpiecing, creating, cultivating, building, resurrecting, reconstructing, protecting, building, extending what he has for you. Say, I am. God's masterpiece. Some parts of our lives we're scared to reveal because we feel like that mess is not a part of the masterpiece. And sometimes it's the mess in our lives that allows us to hold together the other part of the piece. Using glue sometimes is messy, but it's necessary in order for things to stick in our lives. And sometimes it's not until you go through the mess for the message to stick in your life. You can say the good, you can be the good, you can even preach the good, but until you get a little glue on you, it doesn't stick in your life. Sometimes they tell you stuff at an early age, what not to do and don't do this and don't do that. And until you get a little bit of glue in it, then you understand, I shouldn't have. But we don't have to live in the I shouldn't have. We can use it as glue to hold on to the wisdom that God has given. And so it's your mess that allows you to draw closer unto God. I'm thankful for the mess. You can always tell who's been in the mess because their praise is a little bit different. You can always, if you walk into any church around America, the one that's shouting and crying, she done been through some stuff. The God that's on his knees before God, just thanking God, it's not because he was told that he had a little glue on him. How many of y'all got a little glue? I got a little glue. I got a little glue. Say, I've got some glue. But the glue 
isn't always seen. When you're putting a construction project together, the glue is the backstory that holds together what you see before you. See, many of us are good with showing you the facade, but if I tell you about my glue, just give me a few moments to tell you why I'm stuck to God like this. Because I know what it seems like and I know what it appears to be and I know what I'm showing you. But it's because of the glue that I understand that I cannot be who I am without the glue. Because God works in the glue. That's why he came down from heaven to die for our sins. He says, there's a lot of glue down there. <laughs> and I need to show you that your glue is not going to be your legacy. It's what's on top of the glue that we see. It's on top of the glue. It's on top of the mistake. It's on top of the misinformation. It's on top of me failing. It's on top of me walking incorrectly. It's on top of me messing up. It's on top of the mistakes. It's on top of that. You've made a mistake, but it's time to put something on top of the glue. Some people cover things up. Some people put a blanket over it. Some people try to cover it up, but no, I'm not talking about putting something over the mess. I'm talking about putting something in front of it to make the glue stick so that I know that I'm stuck to God for my purpose. Jeremiah 33, and he's given this promise. But the Bible says that in Jeremiah, he mentions 16 times that the days are coming. Somebody say the days are coming. The, the, the first seven times that it talks about the days are coming, it's talking about the destruction of Israel. It's talking about that there's going to be a season and a time where there's going to be destruction. You are going to fail. You are going to be broken. You are going to be stripped away. You are going to lose everything that you have. The days are coming. It says that seven of those, the days are coming, is prophesying things that are very, very negative, that are bad, that are not great, that are not good, that are not holy, that are not pleasing, that are not good news, that are not good rapport, which is what God tells us to focus on. For seven times, he declared that things were going to be worse than what they really are. But the last nine times were for the future period of the blessing of Israel. Seven times destruction, nine times promise, seven days lack, nine times power, seven times defeat, nine times victory, seven times failure, nine times success, seven times Lost it all. Nine times got it back. He says he's going to restore the promise for you just like he does with the sun during the daytime and the moon by night. If he won't break his covenant with time, he won't break his covenant with you. Somebody say the story gets better. We talked about chapters in your life. Some of you are in a chapter that you can't wait to get out of. Some of you are living in the best chapter of your life. Some of you are in between chapters. You're not sure how this chapter is going to end. But the thing that's so good about the chapter is the chapter is not the story. It's only a small piece. And we never, wear, we never throw away the whole puzzle because of a piece. We continue to build around it, and sometimes when you put a puzzle together, if there's a piece missing, sometimes you don't know that it's missing. Because everything else is so well put together that it camouflages the holes in your life. When God puts you together, there may be some holes in your life, but it may be camouflaged by God's power. It's God's forgiveness that shows the world the full peace, even with the peace is missing. All of us, if we're honest about it, we're missing some pieces. 
But I'm thankful that I am not going to be known and my legacy is not on the piece that's missing, but it's the full masterpiece of my life. The Bible says it this way. It says that when we stand before God and he shows our lives on this screen for everybody to see, it says that when the sins or the holes come up, it's going to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That the lamb that was slain, that yes, you messed up, but you don't have to be known by that because we're going to cover that with the blood. When the blood shows up, you know that there's some glue behind that. read it, but we didn't throw away the paper because of the mistakes. We just hooked up with an editor that knew how to edit the mistakes and be able to transform those things that were wrong so that then when it's presented to the world, it'll be presented in such a way that they say, that is a masterpiece. I'm looking for some people that say, I'm hooked up to the best editor, to the best person that can help me to overcome all of my mistakes, all of my semicolon misses, all of my mispronunciations, all of my misspelled words, all of my mispronounced things in my life. I am here to be able to say that my God is the best editor that I've ever seen. Because he is a masterpiece maker and he knows how that if we just begin the project, he says, I'll forget it, I'll finish it, and I'll perfect it. He will perfect the full book, but you just got to finish writing the chapter. Every day that we wake up, we put black words on white paper. Every day that we wake up, we write another page in our story of life. But the thing is, are we writing a good story? Or is it a story that we need some blood to come over? Whether it's been a bloody first half or an intermingled first half, we can say today that, Father, I want you to write me a new story. I want to be like Alfred Noble. I don't want to be the merchant for death. I want to be the person that's known for life-giving. Because even in our history, as we celebrate, celebrate Black History Month, many of us, when we think about black history on a larger scale or when it's portrayed, it always predates and it goes back to slavery. But I want to tell you this, that slavery is not who we are. Slavery was just a short chapter in our heritage. Even if your family was owners of slaves and maybe they mistreated people, that's only a small piece and portion of your life. And you don't have to be known by that anymore because you can rewrite the story. The only way that a story can be rewritten, it has to be done in the absence of that very thing. Carolyn Williams Samuel's mom said something so great. She asked me a question. She says, how does a thief 
not be a thief anymore. My initial response was, was that they should stop stealing. She said, no, that doesn't not make him a thief anymore. She said, the only way that a thief cannot be a thief is he has to start to give things and sow things and, and, and bless people. And so the only way that we can overcome what we've taken away is we have to give into that thing. And so the only way that we can say that I'm a conqueror is not to stop sinning, it's now to give life to something else. Because if truth be told, we will never be able to stop sinning unless we're moving in the direction of purpose. Because when I have purpose, sin is not on my mind anymore. I'm only thinking about how I can bless you and bless God in the process. Because I am a part of God's masterpiece. So for us, it's better for us to come into the knowing that the only way that I can really complete the project of God is for me to plan with God. I'm going to say that again. The only way that I can complete the project with God is to plan with God. If God is not at the meeting or your planning sessions or your moments where you're putting your day together, then you'll never create the masterpiece that God has planned for you. You've got to bring him to the table for the plans. And when he comes to the table and he starts to architect and start to construct and start to, to build and tell us what we need to do and what we don't need to do, it's in those moments that now we're working with the master planner. And what I know about masterpieces is that when you have a master planner, they tend to last longer. And as they last longer, they're worth more value to the world than what you've done by yourself. You can do some great things by yourself, but they probably won't be as good as the things that God can do when he's at the table helping you to plan. Last week we said that our now is God's one. And so once we change our perspective, we want to make winner decisions that are not based on now. You've needed a lot of glue before because you were only thinking about now. But when you hook up with God's masterpiece and his master plan, we don't longer plan for today. We plan for the ending of the book. I know on my last day on earth, whether it's today or whether it's 60 years from now, I want to be in a position where I can say it is well within my soul. That everything that God has put inside of me, he's poured out and I'm leaving it as a legacy to those that are there. So to see my daughter who's seven years old say, I want to live. See, to you that may not mean anything, but I know how much time that I've spent with my daughter trying to show her and teach her the things of God. Not only the good things that daddy has, but even walking her through the, the bad things that I don't want to show the world. She'll know it all. So when she presents herself, she can say, I want to live for you, God. Because my daddy lived for you. And I saw what great things my daddy did. And it's not because of, of, of him that I want to live, but he showed me his father. And I'm thankful that I can say that with a double entendre, that I can show her my father, and she'll still know that there's God. Because our goal is to leave a lineage. That the covenant that he didn't break with the sun and with the moon, he won't break with my family. That there will always be somebody in my family that will be the rock, that will be the, the foundation, that will be the person that speaks and declares the bold things about God, that there will not be a break in the generation. God has promised me that. That we are of the Levitical lineage the royal priesthood, that it will flow through my lineage. That others will be preachers and pastors and declares of the good things of God, that they'll be able to speak about the gospel. Why? Because what you talk about is how people are going to remember you. Write that down, what you talk about. So, so this is a growth moment. You can talk about your addictions, you can talk about your anxiety, you can talk about your anger, you can talk about your mistakes, you can talk about all of those things, and that will be a part of your legacy. But the question is, do you want those things to be your legacy? Or do you want that just to be the glue 
to be able to be the backstory for what God is really doing in your life. When people see you, they don't want to see the struggle. You can tell them about the struggle, but they want to see you having success. And so my prayer is, is that you speak about the success of God, that you speak about the good things of God, that you speak about the way you overcame, that you speak about the vision of God, that you speak about what you were planning at the table, that you speak about the masterpiece, that you speak about this, this thing that I'm doing right here is bigger than me. It's a God-sized vision because I know my purpose. I'm speaking to you today about purpose. When I die, you will say that man had great vision, but he lived with great purpose. Not, oh, he was this, and oh, he was, was that, and oh, he did this, and oh, he did that. When people say that, that's just the glue that makes me move a little bit further in my purpose. And so, what you talk about will be how people rem remember you. But the second thing is when you create with God, you are creating a future that cannot fail. When you create with God, when you plan with God, you are creating a future that cannot fail. How many people want to create a future that cannot fail? I want to, I want to create a lasting legacy that it's built on a foundation, anchored in Christ Jesus. That the story that I live on a daily basis will be a story worth telling. Not only when I tell my story, but other people will tell my story. Alfred Noble never met the guy, but this morning I told his story. Why? Because he decided to rewrite his obituary. God's story is ultimately what gives our lives meaning because we're standing on the shoulders of people that God has put before us. The only way that you were able to reach your success, to reach what you've done, to reach your accomplishments, is because you stood on the broad shoulders of somebody else. But here's the thing, those that are going to live a lasting legacy are those that grow shoulders wide enough so that other people can stand on. So I'm thankful for the shoulders that I stand on, but my prayer is, God, give me broad shoulders so that other people can stand on the things that you built inside of me. I want to be a foundation. I want to be a pillar. I want to be a strong tower that others can mount up on top of me and say, I'm standing on the legacy that Carlos Jones left. And so every day I'm in the gym doing military press. God, give me bigger shoulders. Not literally. But when I'm at the table with God, I'm getting bigger shoulders. So that when I can mentor somebody, bring somebody in, talk to somebody, they'll be able to stand on the wisdom that comes from heaven. Somebody say, I want big shoulders. I want big, I want big shoulders that people can stand on. Here's the thing about Jeremiah since we're finishing off the book today. Jeremiah had to write his story twice. The first time that he wrote his story, it was destroyed by one of the kings of his day so that his story and his words would never be remembered. But Jeremiah said, no, this story is worth telling. And so he didn't quit when the story was destroyed. He just wrote it over again. I'm talking to somebody today that needs to rewrite their story because the first one was destroyed. Your legacy for your children may have been terrible, but you can rewrite that starting today. There may have been a, a, a disconnect. There may be some intermarital affairs. There may be a kids out of wedlock. You may have a child in every city, but that does not have to be your legacy. You can change that today by giving everything that you stole. Some of us have been thieves of time. We've procrastinated. We've stole time. Some of us have been, been thieves of money. We've, we've stolen money and we have not used it or appropriated. Some of us have stolen ideas and, and we've stolen vision. And the only way that we can do it is to give vision, to give money, to give purpose, to give time, to give those things that we have consumed. Some of us have been so consumed with the broken past that we failed to move forward. But my prayer is today, that you'll be able to persevere because it's going to be possible. Neil Cole said it this way. He says, there's 
a thing called finishing well. But that's not what we do at the end of our lives. It's what we do every day of our lives. Knowing that our purpose will allow us to be able to, to sit, stand, lay on that last day and say, it is well within my soul. That everything, that every plan, that everything that God has set before me, it shall come to pass. But it will be even greater for me to say, it has happened, it is done, it is finished. The same way that Jesus finished his. When you can say it is finished, that means it's complete. That means that the plans have gone through every stage. The building has been built. And now it's time for somebody else to take the reins to be able to further the vision. We're building. And so in the midst of, of this building, a legacy, we found 17 acres. 17 acres of good land. The land was 1.5 listing price. We've been able to negotiate. And they've come in at 1,050,000. That's a four hundred and fifty thousand dollars savings. That's not a. Uh, that's that's that, yeah. That's not ten. That's not ten dollars off. That's that's four hundred and fifty thousand dollars off. And so, as as we learn about this land, there there are a few different things that we have to do. We have to get a land loan, which is going to be about twenty to twenty five percent of the one million fifty thousand. You can do the math. If it's a million, then it's two hundred and fifty thousand plus maybe 300000 And then once you get the, the land loan, then you have to get a construction loan. And the construction loan is what allows you to build on the land. And then at the end of it, you'll compile it into a mortgage, which is the life of the loan. Now, we can handle the life of the loan, no problem. We bring in enough to be able to handle the life of the loan, no problem, when we get to that phase. But at the initial phase, we have to, to come up with the funds to be able to get the first two things done. The first thing is the land loan, say land loan. And the second part is the construction loan. Now, I, I put numbers together uh, in the preliminary stages and it looks like everything is going to cost us maybe uh, 1.3 or 1.4 million to do everything initially. That's not what the, the building, the final building, but it's the initial for us to get a sprung structure or a prefabricated tin building, lay the foundation, put the parking lot, get the plumbing in, get the electricity ran, get the HVAC done, and get us to the point where we can go in into our space and be able to now put money that we're putting towards this building and, and our spaces to now put it towards that. So we're doing our due diligence. But there's one small problem. I think we've raised maybe closer to twenty-five to $30,000 towards that. So we're at a deficiency of about, I'd say probably $225,000. But someone once, someone once told me, if money is your biggest issue, then it's really no issue. I'm sure they weren't broke. Because as good as that sounds, many of you all know that that's uh, that ain't the way it seems when you got to pay. So this is what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pray first. And then I'm asking you to meditate and, and, and ask God, God, how can I be a, a partner in this? And I know we've done the initial 1,000. Some of you have given 1,000. Some of you have given 5,000. We've had pledges for 10,000. And that's got us off to a good start. And I believe that God is going to complete the work. So we're off to the right start. And so we need to go into a, 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 a chapter of fundraising to get what we've needed. Now, we haven't started a, a number of fundraising before because we didn't know what number we needed to meet. Now we know this is what it's going to take for us to get into this place and in this particular time. And so there's, there's a, a, a few different creative ways that we can go about that. One is we can use some of our assets that we have as a church that we has Per, have personally to be able to put those up so that they can then give us the money based on what we have in assets. So if that's some, some way that you feel like, oh, I can contribute that way, then I'm asking for you to do that. I'm even thinking about there's $100,000 equity in my home and, uh, you know, Sparkle and I are praying about how we'll work this thing out. But one thing I am for sure, God has given me a piece about it. 
and we're going to get it. We're going to get it. We're, we're going to, we're, we are going to get it. How long is it going to take us to get it? But I can make this one thing for sure. That any time I've walked on any piece of land or property, and I know it was mine, I knew it was mine. And I believe that when I walked in that property, it was Inspiration Church Village. It was Inspiration Village, and there's going to be a great vision as a town. We won't unleash everything, but the first part is getting us our own space to worship in. Amen? So that we can have and do the liberties, the things that we can do. We've already got a track record of giving things into the community. We've already, they know Inspiration Church as one that goes into the schools, that meets the needs of the people, that helps and provides. And we've been doing that since the beginning. They know us for that. That's a good legacy. But now as we get into the second part of our legacy, it's going to take us to make some sacrifices in order to do something greater than us and beyond us. So I want you to think about the people that are in your network. Think about the people that are connected to you. Think about the people that may be willing to partner with us for a season to be able to sow maybe a one-time donation or maybe a continual donation. Whatever that is, I'm believing that God will give us the ability and the opportunity to be able to do that. Because, it's, of course, the building is not just for us to hold awesome worship services on Sunday. That's great. But there's a whole lot more that God has in store for us to do. So please be in prayer. You know the number. 225,000, that's the number. That's the number that we have to come up with to get this thing going, to get it, to get it moving, to be able to accomplish what God has given us. And I believe that God is going to send the support. That we may have everything that we need in this room right here. We may have it. And if we've got it then I pray that God reveals it to us so that we can see it and move in the way that God has us to move. Amen. Pastor Jordan's going to come up here and do a very, very quick, quick, fastest one we've ever seen. We've got about eight minutes. He is going to do the, the fastest offering and announcement that you've ever seen in your life. And then we're going to do a very meaningful but very short communion. And then we're going to get out of here. Amen. Well, glory to God. Glory to God. Somebody say, this is my story. Glory to God. Please excuse my shirt. I got a little glue on there. I consider this glue. Uh, the daughter had an accident on me, and I was trying to let it dry up, but God said, that's the glue. Don't worry about it. So anyway, well, we do thank God uh, for the message that you gave today, Pastor Carlos. Such an amazing message. Uh, but at this moment, we have three appeals that we must give before we leave this place. My first appeal is for salvation. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never admitted, believed, and, and confessed that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, right now is that time. If that's you and you're here today and, and you're here with us physically, if you could just raise your hand, we'd love to extend that salvation offer to you. And then if you're watching with us virtually, if you could just type in, connect, or put up a hand emoji, we'd love to connect with you. Here's my second appeal. The second appeal is for rededication. Maybe you've been in a chapter in life and maybe you've thought that this is how life would end. You kind of strayed away from God. Well, I'm here today to tell you that that is not the end of your chapter. And so if that's you and you want to rededicate your life to Christ, get back in the graces of God. Get back in right standing with God. Just raise your hand or type in connect and we love to join you in that manner. And then here's my third and final appeal for church membership. If you say, hey, I've been joining Inspiration Church. It's been amazing, but now I want to join as a member. Just raise your hand. Our doors are always open. We you would love to extend that offer to you. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, here are a few of our podium announcements. Before we move into our podium announcements, how many people are excited about giving, about our worship through giving and offering? Come on, how many cheerful givers do I have this morning? Well, glory to God, if you're here with us physically and you want to give by method of cash, you could just raise your hand. But here are three methods that you can give by electronically. The first method that you can give by is through our website, which is www yourinspirationnow.com you can click the donate tab there and you can give by that method the second way that you can give is by cash app you can go in and type in dollar sign inspiration church and then the third and final way that you can give is by our app which is fellowship one go whichever way you choose to give we mix our faith with yours and we believe that God will open up the windows of heaven upon you and pour out blessings on you that you don't have room enough to receive and then if you still want to contribute to uh, our thousand plus giving please make sure that you uh, type in other uh, in your giving so we can make sure that those things get contributed for. Amen? Well, glory to God. Well, let us pray over the tithing and offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you, Father. 
for who you are. Father, we do thank you and praise you that everything that we go through is a part of our story. Well, Father, right now we're in a chapter where you have called us to build and arise. Father, we're in a chapter where we're looking for our own space. Father, we're in a chapter where we no longer want to have to go place to place, but Father, we want to be stationary. And so, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for those who have been pouring into and those who have been contributing and donating. Father, not just to the building, but Father, just to your cause and being obedient and faithful to your command of giving and tithing. And so, Father, right now, we thank you for those who were able to give and then for those who were not able to give father we pray that you would soften their hearts so that they can have the understanding to give on the next time and then father we pray for those who may not have for those who may be without and for those who may lack father we pray that you would increase them it's in jesus name we pray come on somebody say amen in this place today well glory to god here are a few podium announcements as you know i have to speed this thing but you all know that we do have our store which is right here it's located you see miss yvonne you see miss brie pointing at our store our store right now is 50 percent off so make sure that you grab you some cool threads and some gear to make sure that you show your love and support for inspiration church and then also to show others uh, what church you are a part of and then also we have our i group fair which is right next to uh, the store i group fair please make sure that you sign up for the i group i groups are getting ready to start soon i groups are getting ready to start soon and then for all of our new members do we have any of our new members in here raise your hand miss reese we see you any new members okay for our new members growth track will be next week growth track will start next week so make sure that you make it to growth track to make sure that you're able to connect with us amen amen well glory to god well before we leave i do have someone that we have to make sure that we highlight uh miss samantha stewart where are you can you rate can you please stand for us is she here hey miss sam how you doing she's at the back a lot of you may not know but miss samantha stewart has been going through cancer and she's been going through her journey of of progression and going through chemotherapy and also everything that she has to go through with that actually miss sam just had surgery yesterday i believe and she's here this morning but what i like to do I'd like to congratulate and also celebrate Miss Samantha for she has rung the bell. She has rung the bell for chemo. Come on, stand up and come on, let's celebrate her today. Glory to God. We thank you for uh, making it through that, Miss Sam. That was just a chapter in your life. And we thank God for your healing. We thank God for you being here this morning. And we absolutely love you, man. Ah, God is so faithful, man. God is so, so faithful. Um, yeah, also, uh, Miss Tam, uh, we do uh, want to thank God uh, for our Black History. This is Black History Month. And so right now, Miss Tam will be presenting us with our Black History Moment. Ernest E. Pierce Sr. served in the U.S. Navy at the age of 20. He was stationed in the Philippine Islands toward the end of the World War II in Japan when the atomic bomb was dropped on Japan, ending the war. He also served in the U.S. Army in the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. He drove for a medical ambulance company with a platoon of 20. They served behind the battle lines, transporting those who were injured or dead from the battle lines to the nearest aid station. He served in the military from 1943 to 1971. Thank you, Ernest E. Pierce Sr., for your role in Black history. Thank you so much for that, Miss Tam. And then also, we'd love for you all to make sure if you have a black history moment like Miss Tam uh, just had for her grandfather, Mr. Pierce, please send in a picture and send in the, uh, their black history moment so we can make sure that we highlight those people in that moment. Amen? Glory to God. Pastor. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. If you can pull out your uh, communion. You know, your cup represents 
the best glue covering that you could ever see. And we see this, this, uh, this glue come out, and covering of the glue in Matthew 26. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell y'all, when I drink from this fruit of the vine, from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It's a part of our legacy. So, Father, I just pray right now, God, that you forgive us for all sins, for all things, Father, that have become glue in our, in our lives, that have made a mess, that have made things awkward. We're thanking you, God, that we don't, have to leave that as a legacy, but you can make all things new. And so, Father, today, many of us are saying that we're going to rewrite our obituary. And we know that this communion is a sign and a symbol that it gives us a second chance. So, Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Jesus did at the table, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken. And then he said, I know you have a lot of glue in your life. Some of y'all need more, more juice, more wine. But he said, you don't need that much. All you need is a little bit. He said, this is my blood that is shared for you. Take and drink. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you were about to go through. And how even in the end, you weren't focused on yourself. But you were focused on your purpose. Help us to fulfill the masterpiece and the master plan that you set before us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that you rewrite your obituary. I pray that you write what you would love to see. And I pray that you will walk in purpose and walk in the good things of God. Today we have the last week of our, uh, our purpose journey. It's the last week of Unique. And uh, after this week, the good news is, the great news is, is in a couple of weeks, we'll start the next class, and you'll be able to go through it. So if you missed this first time, you'll be able to do it again, and we'll give you the testimonies so that you can hear all of the things and hear everybody that has gone through and that has been a great part of that. So I'm thankful for you. Uh, I pray that God continues to bless you. I pray that his, his face continually shines upon you, that he's continued to be gracious to you, that he gives you peace, that you know that I can walk in purpose, and no matter what type of mess or what type of glue I have, I know I have the blood of Jesus Christ that will cover it and allow me to be the masterpiece that God has created me to be. I pray that as you walk, no matter what you go through, you will know that you can love, you can live, and you can lead. May God bless you. Y'all have a great day, and we'll see.